How long you been there? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I like to protect my friends only because I feel I now I have. I never did in the giving talks, and I feel I have a responsibility to 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 protect my friends. Do we need a break? Uh huh. Okay. Can we do ten so we can get done by four, and I can get through the rest of this and give you all the magic secrets to a happy life from this day on? Ten minutes. What did you say? A pill? Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of people starting to think that some of those antidepressants are. I'm curious. Um, Finish up. We're on a home stretch here. Those guys make me feel like, you know, I'm just not doing it right. I just do it right. He, uh, he was asking me to talk about Tony Robbins and NLP and those things, and he says, those guys make him feel like he's not doing it right. What do I think of that stuff? Okay. There's a lot of things that can get me to walk across hot coals. Okay? Believe me. Put a stack of cash, put a gorgeous woman, put a car that I really want. I, there's a lot of things I'll say, you babe, move. You know, you're in my way. And I'd smoke across it. What that process means to some people, I don't know. Because I know I would do it under the, 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 any kind, some kind of, if I had to save my life, I'd walk across the coals. If I had to save my daughter's life, I wouldn't, he wouldn't even think about it. You know, I'd be running so hard, I'd be digging my feet into the coal. So I hear people say that they really get something wonderful out of that. It's, for me, most of those things are too professionally oriented. They're about, they're about my becoming some powerful person, you know, powerful person. I want to just be me and then through that me, I want to find out who I am and that will be enough. I will be an extremely powerful person. If I can be me in all circumstances, I have all the power I need for life. But I'm not opposed to any of that stuff. You got to go do what works, you know. A buddy of mine went skydiving. That's next on my list. Now, 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 get it. When I just stand up here casually and say, hey, you know what? Skydiving is next on my list. If you think I am calm about this, not even close, man. I have already gone over all the things that can go wrong. You know, how I can die or how I can land like that one guy in a cornfield that's, you know, had rain on it for seven days and he went down in about four feet of mud, you know, and he lived. And, you know, I mean, I go, I'm just through all of it, you know. And I, I know that if I think the rides at Six Flags are really a trip, going out that door is going to be fucking incredible. <laughs> and just flying and looking at the ground. Think about that for a minute. I mean, holy God. I haven't been able to do anything with the Navy since the last time. I used to do all kinds of workshops for the Navy and finally said, nah, that's it. I'm not doing another one until you put me in the back seat of an F-14 and catapult me off an aircraft carrier and take me to the top of their ability where that you can... There are certain jet fighters, I'm not sure which one it is, I quote a number like I know, and, and there, but there's one that goes up about 60,000 feet and you can see the entire curvature of the earth when it comes over and comes back down that they catapult off those carriers. I said, when you take me on that ride, I'll come back and do more workshops for free. Normally the Navy pays. Never heard from them since. I said, I'm willing to go to the altitude uh, acclimation school. You know, I mean, I'll do all that stuff on my own. Because I have a friend that works for Continental Airlines. He'll take me down and get me, you know, acclim acclimated to the different altitudes. And, you know, but they just, do you think I would go to get in that one and sit calmly in the back seat about the time the catapult's ready to go off? I would be so fucking scared. Terrified. Terrified. And on landing, coming back. I mean, I'd, I'd have all the thoughts. It's going to fall out of the sky. <clears throat> My first wife in sobriety, your ex-husband, had flown a jet right into the side of a carrier. You know, I mean, I would just, I could be nuts. But I know the end of the experience would be joy. Just that I did it. I just did it. You know? And what was it like to see the curvature of the earth? Whoa. I'd love to go up in the space shuttle. I don't think I'm in the shape John Glenn is in. I know I'm not today. <clears throat> anyway, onward we go. Adventures. Do stuff you haven't done. Go camping, for God's sakes, if you haven't ever been camping. If you can't do it alone, take somebody with you that camps all the time. They'll make the first time so easy you'll never you'll wonder why you never went before. 
People camp all the time, man. They got the tent up in four minutes and the stove's out and shit out and they're sitting in a chair, a lawn chair, reading a book. Very happy and the whole thing's set up. Go with somebody that really knows camping. It's okay. You see, it's okay to ask for help. Most of us don't have a reality on that. I have always perceived asking for help as, as, as um, letting you know my weaknesses. And if I let you know my weaknesses, you're going to get me. I know that. I know that. So I feel I'm inadequate, I'm insufficient, I'm incomplete if I have to ask somebody to do it with me. No, I'm not. I'm intelligent. I am, I am well mentally. I have identified a need and I am about a solution to the need. I need to go out and go camping and have fun. I cannot do it alone. I will find my buddy who camps all the time and ask him if he'll take me. First time I ever went camping was with a buddy of mine on a program who was like a mountain man, you know? We went camping, I don't know, we had hammocks and shit made out of rope that he found in the campground and he went out and cut down a tree, a tree about this big around with a rock, you know, to have fire. I mean, I'm watching this guy like, what is all this? But he, it, was out, it was Tina and I and, and, and Alexander and him and he made it easy with almost nothing. So I started thinking, well, a camp stove and a tent and a few things like that, you know, this could be an almost feral thing being out here in the wild. The next time I went camping, I went camping with somebody who really knew how to camp. And it was great. Find somebody that knows how to do what you want to do if you're afraid to do it alone. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It means that you're intelligent. Asking for help is mental health. I need help with this, okay? I seek approval and affirmation. Well, yes, we do. That takes a long time. If you can deal with some of this first stuff, start having fun. Um, accept that you are exactly where you are right this minute and nothing could change that. If you can incorporate some of those into your being, then getting to the, you won't be constantly seeking approval. You know, you won't be constantly seeking approval. I'm either responsible or super irresponsible. Well, I'm both. I don't, you know. Again, that's one where I would need, I need a partner to work on. Because I don't know when I'm necessarily, when I'm in this stuff, I don't know when I'm in it. So I need somebody who I have given permission to enter my life and tell me, don't you think you're a little off the edge here, Bob? Hmm? Don't you think 14 rewrites is too many? <laughs> you know, whatever. Somebody I've given permission, and this is an important one. Someone I have given permission to, to enter my life and give me their observations or opinions on this subject. I don't want somebody barging in there. I will share at a meeting, I will sit something. When I was going through the divorce, I was so completely trashed. I went to this noon med stag every day in L.A. And I would tell them when I talk, I'd say, I do not want feedback from anyone in the room under any circumstances, even though I know you know you have the answer. Shut up. You know? As I didn't want it. I'll give you permission if I want your opinion on my life. That's setting a boundary. That's a hard one, but it's a great one. Once you get it up, people get it. You know, I'm controversial as hell in AA. You think anybody comes up directly, directly to me? Nah. I always get it secondhand. Nobody comes up and says, I hated your talk, you're a maniac, you're ruining AA. I hear that shit all the time. You're probably due to drink any minute, or you're drunk, or you're this. I hear that stuff all the time, but it's never one-on-one. -on -one. Why? Because... If you, you'll pick up from me when you walk up to me, I'm not giving you permission to make observations in my life. I don't even have to say a word. You'll just know that this is not a great idea. You know? Of course, it doesn't mean you won't necessarily do anything about it. I went to the altar a few times knowing it wasn't a great idea either. It didn't stop me. I had this little voice saying to me, this is not a good idea. I said, quiet. I need this to be complete. I am extremely loyal even in the face of evidence that the loyalty is undeserved. This problem will almost take care of it yourself if you've been able to include a couple of people to help you with these other issues.
becomes like a little family, two or three of you, doing this process together. I am, I, the thing I want to do most is isolate, do the work, come out, and then tell you how good I feel. I don't want to be out there when I need the help. I want to come out and tell you after I've resolved it. It's tough being out there when you need the help. It's tough getting up to a lectern and admitting you need the help. It's tough being in a small discussion meeting and weeping and admitting that you need the help. Okay? I look for immediate as opposed to deferred gratification. I don't know what the hell I'll tell you about that one. I just got out of sugar like two months ago. Completely out of control on the sugar. Completely. And the nuts. <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't really severely injured myself on a can of nuts, you know. <laughs> Cut my nose or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you pull that sharp lid out, you know, and so when you're trying to... <laughs> You get in to try and get all you can with your finger if you're like me. Well, this one would be one I would use the, you know, the immediate gratification would be one I'd use the phone for. This would be one I'd find a phone buddy for. Maybe more than one that I could call before I grab the cookies or the peanuts or, or, or you know, make uh, uh, arrangements for a date with the redhead in the corner, that I could run out in the hall and get on the phone and say, Jim, you know, I'm thinking about going up to the market and getting just one package of Pepperidge Farms tall white chocolate macadamia nut cookies. <laughs> they are good. They're really good. I can eat two packages of them in, you know, <laughs> minutes. <laughs> yes. I got a question for you. Okay, Dan. Um, when I think of immediate gratification, what I think about is um, I've done something good for somebody or I've, I've done something I think is nice and no one's come up to me and said, hey, that was a good job or hey, thanks, you did that right. And uh, to me, that's a little bit more difficult to deal with than just the craving for the peanuts or something like that. So what do you, what do you recommend for something like that? Same thing? Get that's, on the phone with somebody? and Yeah, because that's codependency at its finest. I mean, codependency, you can never, ever figure out in advance, as far as I can tell, in advance whether or not what you're about to do is codependent or not. You will only know after you have done it. Because we are apt to leave somebody in the street bleeding while we try and figure out whether or not making a tourniquet out of our belt and helping this person is an act of codependency or an act of human kindness. And while that guy's laying, <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, I'm, tr I'm, I'm on recovery here, man. I'm doing the best I can. I'll get to you in a second. You know, it, it's like the old joke about, uh, about the codependent who, you know, went off the cliff and, and, and the ski team came up and looked over and he said, oh, don't come down here. It's awful. You know? <laughs> so go ahead and do the act, whatever it is, the act you're worried about. And afterwards, you will know whether or not it was an act of codependency. If you feel good about what you did, it is an act of human kindness. We can't do enough human kindness. If you feel ripped off, it was an act of codependency. It's that simple. Some of this stuff, people make sound so complicated because the books written on it are 260 pages long. Well, they're only 260 pages long because the publisher wants to charge you $17.95. The author who wrote it could probably explain the entire concept of what he's saying in 12 pages. You know, but you go to read the book, oh God, I can't read that. That's how simple it is. You feel ripped off? Then you weren't doing it out of human kindness for this person. You were expecting something in return. This is codependency. Whether it's a smile, a thank you, I love you, money, I don't care what it is. But most of me gratification is that thing in advance. I want something now. You know, get a phone buddy. That would be my that would be my advice. That's usually what I try and do. I'm not always successful, but most of the time. I lock myself into a course of action without giving serious consideration to alternate behaviors or possible consequences. That's very compulsive, very obsessive. If you've been successful in working on the ones up to this, 
you're going to find that you're not so easily do you lock yourself you're not so easily do you lock yourself an editor would go crazy <laughs> not so easily do you lock yourself it's not so easy for you to lock yourself into a course of action without considering the alternatives it will become an, 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 an automatic result hopefully of having a phone buddy having somebody to do a couple of things with you like go have fun with you or go camping with you or whatever so some of this stuff is a progression as you deal with those up front you're going to have less to deal with as you get towards those near the end that's why all this is called a process it's a process it's now about starting at number 15 I seek tension and crisis and then complain about the results. <clears throat> Phone buddy. Phone buddy. Absolutely. The minute it starts, the minute you identify it or recognize it, go call your phone buddy. They'll help diffuse it. What a phone buddy will do is help you diffuse it. And once you can diffuse it a little and get some of the tension out of it, it can be dealt with in, a, in an appropriate way. I avoid it, rarely, rarely do I deal with it. I avoid conflict or the same thing, or aggravate it, rarely do I deal with it. Then of course it becomes just like, you know, when wrong promptly a minute, make amends, you say to your partner, whoever it was, that you just stuck the kitchen knife into, that, uh, yeah, I'm really sorry, this is not appropriate, you didn't deserve this behavior, this is my behavior, it has nothing to do with you. Oh, that's a tough one to eat. Try doing it with a kid. I used to make apologies to Alexandra over stuff that I had done was inappropriate, it wasn't okay. I, I used to hate getting on my knees on the floor with her and saying, you know, Daddy, sorry. I mean, I didn't say it that way. It was humiliating, it was embarrassing, it was, oh, God, it was awful, but I knew it was critical to her getting what's appropriate in life. If I don't apologize when I've said something wrong or done something that's inappropriate, then how the hell she's going to, you know, why would she ever acknowledge her own behavior? It's hard to apologize, very hard to own your own stuff, if you're like me. That's the big one. Yes? I find it easier with my children than I do with my husband. She, she said she found it easier with her children than with her husband. I mean, I remember my, my firstborn son was seven months old, and I was holding him on the couch, and, and Kelly and I were having an argument, and we were just you know, yelling at each other, and then I just started bawling, and I was looking down at him, and I thought, you know, you didn't deserve this, and when we finally cut it off and quieted down, I spoke to him, and I've spoken since he was months old, you know, you didn't deserve this, and I'm sorry it happened, and it's been really easy for me to do it. That's why I suggested earlier you need a third party. <laughs> I'm working on it, though. Okay. A third party. We need help. There's nothing to be ashamed of about needing help. It's easier usually as a rule for you women. Because you kind of work in little circles anyway. And, and But for us guys, man, that's that's like, what are you doing, man? Well, I'm getting down with a buddy of mine, getting some help. He's gonna, I've never been camping. He's going to show me how you do it. Ah, oh, you fucking punk man. You got one of your friends showing you how to put your tent. Jesus Christ. You know, let's go get drunk. I forget that. I mean, we take a lot of heat, you know, for being sensitive and gentle. Not, not so much anymore. I mean, we as men today are more blessed than men for centuries. We live in a society that is starting to get it that men are gentle and sensitive and kind and that we not only have the capacity, we are doing it today. And but I'm telling you, you still get heat. And the ads aren't, you know, about the. Have you seen the ads for clones for male? And I haven't seen anyone in there about a gentle male, you know, weeping with his daughter in his arms. You know, it's some guy in pants that he so tight he can't even sit down, and you know, with no shirt, man, looking strong and cool. You know, it's like that's the images we get. I mean, we know you get barraged with them, but we do too. The latest Levi's ad: Our models can beat up your models. For men? Haven't you seen it? Oh, maybe they would only put something like that in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> where it would work. But, but uh, it's, you know, Calvin Klein has all these guys in the jeans, so Levi's got all these guys, you know, with like leather coats and shit and no shirts and muscles and just these badasses. 
about a dozen of them in Levi's and it says underneath our models can beat up your models <laughs> does this help you women hear what we have to go through when we need to go ask for help our models can beat up your models huh I actually like the billboard <laughs> I thought it was very clever. Well, see, I have to live with the... I can view both sides of any subject on any given moment and drive myself completely crazy. So I can entertain myself just watching some news report on television. You know, I remember when they were bringing over all the um, um, Vietnam refugees. I would be sitting there and at one minute looking at the TV with tears in my eyes and thinking, oh, thank God we've got room here. We can take them in. These people can live... And the other, you know, within 30 seconds, I'm thinking we should just torpedo the boat. You know, we don't have enough jobs now, we don't have enough people now, we don't have, a, you know, and I can go from one to the other in a heartbeat. Because I've lived in extremes my entire life. So I view those things that come up in my life in extremes. I don't know how to live in the middle. I can't find the middle of the hall without hitting both walls first. I don't know how to find the middle of the hall without hitting both walls first. And that often isn't enough. You know, I'll have to hit them a couple more times. As I'm passing by in the middle, I'll say, well, that looks pretty calm down there. <clears throat> Over to the other wall, you know. It's, it's, but I'm not going to say I'm some kind of worthless flake because that's how I do it. That's just how I have to do it. I don't know another way. The whole Clinton thing, you know. Can we get off of this sex thing? Jesus, God, the moral police are at it again. He committed an abuse of power. I can go from one to the other in a heartbeat. Absolutely unexcusable, unforgivable abuse of power. Censor him, shut up, and let's go on. You know? How do you vote, Bob? Huh? What would you vote for, Bob? Impeachment or censorship? Uh... You know, you just have to depend on who you caught at the moment. What I voted on. Well, that's who I am. You know? Some people, they might say, oh, you can't make a decision. Well, I can. Actually, I can make two. <laughs> One the extreme opposite to the other, and I can give you a highly convincing argument for either. People wonder why I'm up late at night. I'm working through the news. <laughs> I fear rejection and abandonment, yet I'm rejecting of others. I've got to tell you, I, I do not know how to deal... Maybe someone here will have a suggestion on that other than mine. I, honest to God, do not know how to deal with that one without therapeutic help. I just don't. Yeah. When I started to go inside, Bob, uh, I found out that uh, I had to hold on to my higher power, but also I found out that I, I had to hold on to Paul because I abandoned Paul to save Sally or Bob and always would abandon me without me even knowing I abandoned myself ten years ago. So what I found out is I have to make sure a conscious effort is Paul still with me or not. Okay, that's cool. Were you able to do the work, though, without some outside help? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yes, he, he could. I'll answer that so you don't have to get it on mic. Yeah, I found that um, this re deals with the, the judgment. And, uh, uh, you know, you play, I, as, as soon as I stop rejecting others, because what I'm really doing is rejecting myself, because I'm yes. judging myself yeah. without mercy, like right. I said earlier. So uh, the first step... Well, it's not the complete process for me was to stop rejecting others okay and and that begins a process and I can begin to see how others might accept me were you able to do that without help no okay <laughs> that's how I came to that was with help okay okay anybody else I I, I, I yeah, so you know Paul's got one idea but it was Paul wasn't it? You know, Paul's got one idea and you know here's a couple yes please Ben
Mine happened at a 12-step workshop, and what happened was I knew that I wasn't worth anything, but I knew that God thought I was delightful, and I made the conscious decision if it was a chance or a toss-up between God's opinion and mine, God was more likely to be right than I was. Good, okay. But at a workshop. So, she got it at a workshop, and I know no way to get it without therapeutic help. He got it with therapeutic help, began his process by stopping, you know, with the obvious help and guidance of your therapist, stopping the rejection of other people, which sounds like a good path to take. Um, he got able to get it with the 12 steps and doing the program. Um, you know, so you're just going to have to find which way works for you. I'm sure you would like to have a workshop leader up here telling you exactly what the right way is and how to do it, but you know, I can be comfortable if I can be me. If I got to give you information I don't know about, then I'm uncomfortable. And I just don't want to be uncomfortable. So I can, you know, I have fun. See, I can have fun in a workshop if I can ask you for your opinion or your thought or your idea. What are you thinking? What's happening? And I can learn new things. You know, if I just go and say this is the way, I don't learn anything. And life is just about continuing, continuing to learn. I fear failure but sabotage my success. Well, you know, i got to tell you, that one falls in the same categories. If you can do the work we've discussed up to this point, this will not be a huge one when you get here. You won't be huge when you get here. And you say, well, I need to deal with this one right now because, God damn it, I'm working in a car wash and I have a seven degrees in engineering. <laughs> well, let me tell you something, man. If you don't do the other stuff first, they're going to can you from the goddamn engineering job anyway. So just keep washing cars until you get here. And I'm speaking to someone who worked in a car wash, sober. I started at $1.35 an hour, and then I made it, it was moved to a dollar and a quarter an hour. Four years sober. Taking quarter tips from people. I don't really have the sort of personality that does well taking tips. I don't mind taking your money at gunpoint, but I don't like tips, you know. There are ways to deal with this stuff, and that's not one of them. So, you know, work up to this point and then even if you can get a better job, you will be much more functional in the job. You get it now and it's m more likely than not you will suffer the agonies of the damned because you got all this other stuff that you're bringing in with you to the job. Doing this work, I'd rather be washing cars. You know, I don't have to think, man wash cars and work on this stuff. Something easy. I fear criticism and judgment, yet I criticize and judge others. <sighs> okay, this is a buddy one again. Um, well, I, I don't want this on I don't want this one on the tape. Back on? Oh, you're back on. So I just keep telling you, you need people because I know for me it's a people thing. And I don't want people and I don't want to ask you. I do not want to ask you to help me. I am really one that likes to resolve or solve the problem and then tell you about it. I manage my time poorly and I do not set priorities in a way that works well for me. That again has got to go into the mix of if you if you work with this stuff, this will not be a big deal. If you try and start here, it'll be most likely very difficult. Now there may be somebody who feel differently. You, need to, you feel you may need to pick these out in some order that's more a priority for your life. I can only give you my experience up here and the experience of some of the professionals that I have dealt with and know. And it is very simply this. If you can do the things necessary to get through this part, it really reduces the size of this part. When you're not beating yourself up anymore, it's amazing how easy it is to manage your time better. 
just all the time I use trashing myself. I have to now do things with. <laughs> it's like when I stopped drinking, I said to this guy, what am I going to do with my time? I mean, you know, I, I mean, my whole day was revolved around drugs and alcohol. In the end, just alcohol, getting a drink. What am I going to do sober with my time? I mean, I couldn't even imagine what I would do. <clears throat> it's never been a problem. Now it's like this, you know, it's like, whoa. I don't beat myself up. My time goes immediately to managing it better. This, this is a wonderful, ACA is a wonderful, wonderful program. Its, its solution method is brilliant. The way of dealing with these is absolutely spiritual, it is God-given. Now we've talked about therapy and we've talked so a little about medication, we've talked about all this. Let's end with the big guy and the necessity of God in our lives. See, I'm an absolute firm believer that you're either going to believe that God is and he's all powerful or she is or it is, whatever terminology is comfortable for you, is all powerful, all loving, all present, so you got nothing to worry about, right? Everything is in order. Everything, one of my prayers is, or, or, or meditation things is, everything is in perfect order even though it makes no sense to me. I say that prayer a lot of times during the day. God is in charge. Everything is in perfect order even though it makes no sense to me. Because sometimes my life I'll look at it and go, what in the world? And yet, it won't be long and I'll get it. Everything was in order. It took this to make this happen, which made this happen, which brought that person in my life, which took me there. My only big problem with God is timing. You know? He's just, this 11th hour crap gets me so sick I can't stand it. I mean, if he could just bring in the solution a couple of days quicker, my life would be without so much angst, you know? But it's always the last minute. I've exhausted every resource, I've turned every corner, I've done everything I can, I don't know what else to do, and it shows up. I'd like to see it show up two days before, would be my personal... Uh, huh. It's very easy to do this work and lose track of God. The reason is this. <clears throat> Many of us have um, lost God in a process of trying to heal the other issue. And in these issues, we're trying to find ourselves. Okay? That's what Paul says here. Find yourself. Find yourself, know yourself, be yourself. That's all it is. That's what, that's what recovery is about for ACAs. Find yourself, know yourself, and be yourself. You'll be a free person. Sounds simple, hard as hell, more rewarding probably than you can imagine. When I was about 20 some odd plus years sober, Tommy, my best friend, came to visit Tina and I and Kingman and the baby. Well, she was two then. <clears throat> well, one and a half. And after everybody had gone to bed the first night and everybody's down, mom's down, Tina's down, baby's down, and nanny's down, everybody's comfortable, Tom and I are sitting at the kitchen table having a cup of tea. And I said, so what's going on, man? You know, how are you? He said, I am in the worst spiritual place I have ever been in and I looked at him and I said funny so am I I've never been more disconnected from God than I am and have been for the last couple of years Tommy and I have a great relationship and a great ability to just cut out all the bullshit and go for it the answer and within about an hour and a half what we discovered was this both of us had misused meditation and other spiritual things in recovery. The minute you taught me I could leave my body in meditation, I was gone. I was gone. I used to meditate four hours every morning. I get up at four o'clock in the morning to meditate for four hours. I just loved it. I loved it. I could go away from my body. It's my least favorite place to be. I don't want to be here in this room. I want to be gone. Oh, I loved it. And so I just really separate from myself. And it was good. And it, it was survival tool. And it worked for me. <clears throat> and then I got God. And then what we did is we both had gone into therapy. Kyle and I, we'd worked hard. We'd done ACA. We'd done therapy. We'd done all this stuff. We'd done Gestalt. We did yeah, just, Jesus, it was embarrassing. Compulsive obsessive. 
And we realized that in the process of all that work, what we had done is we had discovered ourselves. I found Bob. He found Tom. Powerful stuff. Two men sitting there who had found out the man that they truly are as opposed to whom they believe themselves to be. Or in our case, because we've known each other so long, as opposed to who we believe each other to be. But what had happened was, once we had found ourselves, both of us were afraid that if we returned to the previous spiritual program we'd had, the cost would be losing ourselves. That if I surrendered to God, I was going to lose me again. And having found myself and having paid such a price to find myself, I was unwilling to surrender, let go, pray, trust. And he was in the same place. We were so joyed and thrilled with having found ourselves. And what's, what could be more further from the truth? then a loving God is going to separate me from my humanness. I am a human because I'm supposed to be a human. I'm supposed to feel all the feelings of that I have. So that's a big one. God and this process, process of recovery. There's a therapist who's an acquaintance of mine. He's really more a friend of a friend of mine in London who always has a third chair in a room that's empty to remind himself and his patient who is really in charge this is God's chair the empty chair I thought that's so cool that's very cool you know I mean if you went an atheist you probably wouldn't be thrilled but beyond that I think that's very cool <laughs> any questions as we wrap this up any ob questions observations differing opinions no I want to get out yes Wait for the microphone. Jerry Springer is on his way. I had a question on, um, before we went to the break, um, when you were talking about your friend and that you had made an observation on their relationship. I don't know about anybody else, but I have this big thing with trust. I will know in my heart that either basically in relationships or friendships, they're not lying, they're not cheating, but I still have that fear of that they are doing something they're not supposed to be doing and um, I have friends and everybody else does that um, can see from the outside but I just wondered how are you supposed to know who who to believe in if you believe in your heart that someone's not um, lying to you or cheating on you and they do it anyways isn't that just something that you have to deal with within your own person kind well of? we kind of have to we kind of have to deal with it all within our own person our own person okay Inappropriate behavior by others in my life is not no longer allowed to, to take place without it being called to their attention by me. I must do that for my own survival. I can't trust my heart in the initial beginnings of a situation because my heart was badly damaged. I was hurt badly as a child. So I don't pick well. Usually my mistrust in others is based by my own where I am at at that moment. If I don't trust you to be sexually um, faithful to me, the odds are I am thinking about, well, you know what, if she becomes a real bitch, I'm going to get that blonde over there, that brunette around the corner. It's just the thought. It seems like an innocent thought at the time, but what makes it tragic is I am then projected on you. Often, once we've had the initial falling in love thing, which is wonderful, it's supposed to be, it's spiritually designed. It's God-given. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. People would have stopped mating a long time ago. You know what I'm saying? But that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And once you get past it, if your heart is telling you that they probably aren't being true, maybe now they aren't. Maybe they were in the beginning too, when it was all that energy and lust and sex and you talk for hours and, you know, phone bills that'll just break your ass, you know, and it's all that great stuff, you know, in the beginning. Then when you just kind of quiet down a little bit from that, it's very well that suddenly maybe the guy is misbehaving and you are picking up true stuff. You've got to ask about it. I condemn everybody no matter what they do. It doesn't matter. Everybody is lying or cheating or 
that's that's just how I perceive the whole world. I understand. <laughs> you want perfection. You, know? you want perfection in others. Yeah. <laughs> perfection in others without perfection in yourself. A need to control situations. I'm just being general here. Nothing specific. Okay. I must condemn me severely before I condemn others. When I do not condemn me, I don't condemn others. So, you know, I'm guessing, and this is just a five cent street corner psychological guess, okay, that it's all about the very beginning stuff, which is I just am merciless on myself. And I ask myself to deliver things that it's killing me to deliver. And sometimes I even don't, and I'm thinking about the opposite. Even if my behavior is good, my thoughts are terrible. And therefore, I attack everybody around me for whatever reasons I find. When I'm cool inside, I have no reason to condemn you. So I'm not okay with me. If I'm out there doing that, I'm not okay with me. And I like the fact you use the word condemn. Usually people in recovery will use judgment. Judge others. Most of us don't judge others. We condemn them. You know, I meet you now, you're an asshole as far as I'm concerned. If somebody asks you about me, 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 ask me about you 15 years from now, I'm going to say, I know him, he's an asshole. I've condemned him to be an asshole for the rest of his life. I haven't judged him on the moment. He's gone. He's history. You know, that's a more accurate word. Be patient with yourself and, you know, probably would be good to get in a relationship right now with some controlling, condemning person. And you could see the behavior in others, and you could really have some good fights and work through some stuff together. <laughs> Save a lot of money on therapy. It'd shorten the process by a year. I'm serious. <laughs> um, what do you think about relationships where everything seems to be harmonious? most of the time because I know a couple and I just I don't know it's really hard for me to conceive that these two people could be so harmonious all the time it's it hasn't ever come that easily to me well you just answered your own question if, if you see I am only able to judge their relationship based on my relationship my experience and what works for me they may have a relationship that makes me want to suck on an exhaust pipe of the car at some level. But for them, it works well. For them, they're moving forward with their life goals. And I have no sense. It's like, you know, like you say, these people appear to be really harmonious really easily. And that's not been your experience. What's well, theirs, apparently. Now, if it doesn't feel real to you, if I go in somebody's house and the house feels cold to me, I mean, literally feels cold to me, and the people are, are like, oh, God, I love each other so much. I know it's bullshit. I know it's bullshit. When I walk in a house where there's love, it's warm. I can feel it in the house. I know in the house. Children know this all the time. All the time. They know this all the time. I'll give you one last little story and we'll close it up. We believe that about children, Tina and I. So with Alexandra, we've always raised her that she could trust her feelings. So she's never been made to sit in Uncle Joe's lap because Uncle Joe has all the money in the family.